and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, the Crafts Council as well. And yep, so um, we've got lots of talks um, originating from a, a two-year project that I've been involved with at Nottingham Trent University, where we've been working with um, a local mind um, who are the UK's largest mental uh, health charity, as you probably know. Um, so my, my co-researchers couldn't be here today. They were here yesterday. So I want to make sure that I'm presenting as if they're here and that uh, hopefully one or two of you met them yesterday. Um, but today they would be Hayley Berry and Josie Collier and Elaine Fell. And we'll see some images of them and see how they've been involved as we go through the project. Um, so this is Josie and Elaine, Josie on your left and Elaine on your right, and I don't know who that is in the middle who's um, jumping into the picture, but um, we like this picture. I checked these slides with them yesterday and they were very happy with that, um, and we'll talk a bit more about them in a moment. The project was called An Internet of Soft Things. It was um, financed by the EPSRC which we thought was quite exciting because we didn't tell them what we were going to make. Normally the engineers like to know what you're going to make um, and therefore it was very difficult to kind of risk assess it, for example. But what the explicit aim of this project was, was really to develop or test a methodology um, for working in mental health, um, working across design and mental health. Um, what I'd seen of um, design for health at the Design for Health conferences, for example, was very much about physical health. Um, and there is a driver towards parity of esteem, it's called, in the NHS for mental health. Um, so there are, there are kind of movements towards funding mental health um, more in line with physical health. Uh, at the moment, the statistics are not good. But one of the big um, ideas was that I've been involved in electronic textiles, wearable technology for over 10 years now. Um, and I'm very privileged to be part of what's called a kind of imaginary. I get to mess about with visions of the future for the Internet of Things, for the smart home, um, for wearables, all that kind of thing. And I became more and more aware that there are, there are sectors of our society who do not get to imagine their futures. They don't get to imagine they, they don't get to exercise their agency now. Um, and I've found this more and more throughout the project, sadly. Um, so the idea was to bring this sector of um, our community, which is extremely large, into that imaginary and to try and facilitate some of that agency coming back. Um, and all the time, in the back of my mind, there's something to do with craft theory at the back of this that needs developing much, much further. Something about empathy, something about where care is, and how we evaluate what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I'll just carry on. So the project, as I said, ended up two years. It was originally funded for 18 months. Um, and so there were like three major sections of that project. Obviously, we can't talk about them all. The, almost the most successful part of the project was the first phase, where we ran um, hands-on workshops at Mind for uh, service users and staff and volunteers, and people learned how to make their own electronic textile things over six weeks. And the methodology we were testing and developing um, is called the person-centered approach. Um, this might be familiar to some of you, it might sound familiar to some of you, but you don't know the background of it. And part of our job was to really learn about this a bit more and to test it. It came out of um, the 1960s, uh, the development of practice and theory in psychotherapy. So really we're looking at the work of Carl Rogers um, and the theories that came out of his practice. And I love that it's practice-based research. It's not evidence-based, it's evidence coming out of practice, which for me really uh, chimes with craft. The important thing to note here is that the National Health Service don't use this very much. They use what's called cognitive behavioral models, which are far more time constrained for mental health service delivery. Um, and so actually there's a kind of weird political dimension to this as well. When we talk about how we ran the, the, the workshops with the making, um, we had to introduce the idea of being non-judgmental, non-directive. It's very difficult um, because electronics work or they don't. And as craft makers, we're very used to evaluating what we're making and being quite critical about the quality and the visual um, qualities of what we make. 
But in this space and in this methodology, we had to be very open and accepting and put aside our assessments of physical work and almost shift the evaluation onto, the relationship, onto how we were conducting our relationships with the people, not judging what they were making. Um, this is also different from user-centered design. And we've heard a little bit about user-centered design, which is extremely valuable in some areas. But for mental health, it doesn't fit very well. It kind of suggests that there's going to be a solution. And for mental health, in this model, um, there isn't really a solution. It's you have to acknowledge that the person is managing a situation and will always be managing a situation. Um, and so there, there's a different model of the person at the heart of what we're doing. I've put this image up. This is from when my um, colleague Martha Glazard presented at Design for Health um, a few years ago. And um, the, there was an illustrator in the audience who illustrated proceedings. And we've got rainbows and unicorns. Because sometimes when you talk about the person-centered approach, it sounds like, well, you're just being nice to people, aren't you? And I'm nice, too. But actually, we're trying to look at the theory and the methodology in a much more rigorous way. So one direct quote from Carl Rogers. Um, he says, in my early professional years, I was asking the question, how can I treat or cure or change this person? And now I would rephrase that question like this. How can I provide a relationship which this person may use for his or her own personal growth? So there's the shift from the user-centered approach, from the medical model approach, into the person-centered approach. So in, in putting this into practice, we have to foreground trustworthiness, the empathic understanding of the individual, and we actually have to be quite proactive as well um, and be warm and valuing. So that's got quite a lot to do with craft, and we've heard quite a lot about care um, already, uh, yesterday in particularly, and, and the word convivial has come up as well. Uh, we've seen the word relational in some of the presentations as well. And I think Tony Fry, as a writer on craft, is very, very useful here at beginning to help unearth and untangle some of those similarities between the person-centered approach and what we think of as craft, as something very meaningful as a process. Um, and in fact, the second to last, I think, line says, craft is that which makes the crafts person. It is thus object and self-forming. And that's exactly what we did find in our making workshops. And of course, we're not alone. We can see these other relevant projects here using textiles, um, and participatory design methods at the bottom, um, a project where Jane Wallace was teaching master's students um, to make sort of experience relational stuff in the moment through making. In the middle, we have work at the Open University where people are making soundscapes using woven textiles and uh, the participants have sight impairments. And Christina Lindstrom and Osa Stahl whose joint PhD was very much about that kind of bringing people into the imaginaries of the future, also with kind of um, digital making and, and textiles. So in practice, in our workshops, we had to encourage people. We had to encourage creativity and open thinking. We had to encourage that agency, which um, partly because of uh, some mental health conditions, but also partly because of experiences, unfortunately, with some of the mental health services, um, people have kind of lost a sense of agency. There's, a, there's a, um, a dampened sense of possibilities and futures, if you like. So actually opening that back up in a very small way in those workshops is very important. You can see my name here. Um, this is a, trans a short part of a transcription where Josie in the top section is talking about color, making decisions about color. Um, and you can see Elaine in the second section who, who becomes aware of the possibility of the material to act as switches. So they started to make on-off switches in their simple circuits using different materials and textures. So suddenly that she's become aware that that is a possibility and she can make that decision and that it might mean something different. Rachel, whose name you can see here in the top section, we had two people, including Rachel, who were trained psychotherapists in the person-centered approach working on this project with us. And of course, reflection is very important for meaning making and authenticity. So how was it to go and use these things or to play with them or even to wear them in some cases? 
Um, Josie is very, very attached to her earmuffs. Um, and she wore these yesterday. She brought a bag of stuff with her yesterday. It didn't, amazingly, it didn't even occur to me. I'm very sorry. Um, and Josie's earmuffs have just got a simple switch on them. They're just on or off, but she can control that. And they've got little LEDs on them, and they keep her warm. So this is um, last Christmas at a Christmas market in Lincoln. Um, and she was very, very happy wearing these out in public. And as facilitators and designers, are you sure you want to wear those in public? Absolutely. And we could hardly get her to take them off. She's very, very proud of them and very happy. And they're very comfortable. And so... Um, as part of the reflection process on the whole experience of doing those six workshops, we invited participants to talk on film and remember what it was like. Um, three of about six or seven people agreed to do this. Um, and you can see this film on YouTube. It was made by a small participatory arts company called Salamander Tandem, who are in Nottingham. There's a whole kind of bunch of stuff we can talk about about that making process of the film as well. And there are three participants on here. So you can go and look at the other two. I'm just going to show you Elaine today. So. Well, the first thing that strikes me is that, I mean, we, we liked the starfish because it's a version of the recovery star. And the first thing that strikes me visually is that you've gone for the best possible outcome on all of those dimensions. And I think it's better than me any of those weeks. I think that's fantastic. So you're also very happy in week six at the end of the process. So self-esteem says workshop making has made me feel really satisfied and happy looking at what I've been able to do. Interactions with others, you're feeling in a good place or you were feeling in a good place week six. And this one is OK to be myself. And you said, before coming to mind, interactions felt much more difficult. Uh, coming here has changed everything. That's wonderful. Mm. We can just stop now, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> and just go out for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also looking forwards, and I think this is really important for everybody too, because... Um, and, and we've said this this morning too with the next bit of the project, is that actually being informed is very important. So this is going to happen. So if you were, you, you were feeling happy about that, so hopefully we can continue to make sure people know what we're thinking about and how you might be involved. And you said it's where, or belonging, on the belonging you said, it's where I want to be. Which is lovely. Hmm. And then we filled in these, didn't we? Everybody had a go at filling in things like this, kind of in the workshop itself. So this one's about the creative process. Um, we asked about challenges. I think Martha brought this along. She was very excited, wasn't she? Remember that? Where the idea that if everybody followed that diagram properly, that you could join up everybody's thing and they would all light up in a big circle
All right, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, um, we didn't have Elaine's voice on that film. You've got my voice. Um, the three people had three different types of um, informed consent. So if you go and watch these films, you'll get different um, versions of informed <laughs> consent there. Yeah, so um, for example, that was Meg that you heard starting to talk. Um, so Meg, you get her voice. Um, Chris, the film before, you get his voice. Meg, you get her whole face, um, her whole body on film. But Elaine decided that she didn't want her face on film and she didn't want her voice, which we were sad about because she's got the most lovely way of phrasing things and saying things. So I can hear her voice. Um, and unfortunately, you can't. <laughs> but if we carry on, uh, next one. Um, so what I want to point out here is that the, the role that Elaine and Josie have played in this project has shifted over time. So they were participants when we started in those workshops. More recently, we're looking at kind of the impact of this. How can we make this a sustainable or, or wider reaching project? And recently, they took part in um, a kind of a workshop for volunteers and staff at MIND who are now going on to develop and run those pro uh, workshops at other MIND venues. So now they have become skilled instructors. Now, just last month, they came to Nottingham Trent University and they ran, they co-delivered a workshop with a bunch of people that they'd never met before. Now, in terms of mental health recovery or management, that is massive. These women had never been in a university before. They hadn't been to Nottingham in 20 years. They live in Worksop, which is a small industrial town on the outskirts towards Mansfield. Um, and they came in and delivered this to a visiting associate professor from the Netherlands, the manager of another charity, Headway, um, a final year undergraduate student who was interested in mental health, and another academic researcher from Object Theatre and Design, as well as all of us. And they did it. They'd never met them before. It was really, really quite an achievement. And for them to come here yesterday, they've never been to anything like this before either, and they were perfectly comfortable. So we're not saying that that's all because of our project, but it's certainly part of, of um, how they've been able to sort of feel well in themselves over the past two years. And we've got more opportunities coming up. Um, so we're negotiating with them, discussing with them how much involvement do they want going forward? Would they like to, for example, start an advisory group that can advise on research in mental health and design? Um, they're going to help co-deliver those workshops in Mansfield throughout December. And in February, we'll be taking it back to the training institute who trained our two psychotherapists in the person-centered approach um, to their research showcase as well. In terms of kind of research themes and making, what do we actually want to build out of this? We did start doing some co-design with the actual data. If we're collecting all of the data using smart things on our bodies or carrying them around, what kind of models do we want to use to design with? The standard models are cognitive or behavioral. Big data is behavioral. What we're doing is person-centered. So how do these things start to marry up? How can we kind of inform that um, process of innovation in the future? And here you can see Elaine and Josie working with Stephen Battersby, who is a, a serious gaming expert who did a lot of the kind of background um, facilitation of the, the technology for us. So we have networked soft things here that were taken out on walks, and they're looking at the data coming in. Thank you. I can explain that slide to you over coffee. <laughs> or in the, in the plenary session at the end, you can ask us what our future work might be, and I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs>